everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk with EBB childbirth class graduates, Samantha Parker and Justin Fontaine, about their exciting hospital water birth story. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Rebecca Decker, pronouns she, her, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Today, we are so excited to welcome EBB childbirth class graduates, Samantha and Justin. Before we interview Samantha and Justin, I want to let you know that if there are any detailed content or trigger warnings, we always post them in the description or show notes that go along with this episode. And now I'd like to introduce our honored guests. Samantha Parker, pronouns she, her, is an environmental scientist with the state of California and an avid runner. And her husband, Justin Fontaine, pronouns he, him, is a principal systems engineer and a CrossFit level two trainer. They live in Rockland, California with their almost 10-year-old son and now their happy baby girl, Kira. Samantha and Justin are graduates of the EBB childbirth class with EBB instructor Lori Suggs, and they're here to share their most recent birth story, which happens to be a hospital water birth story, which we don't hear very often. So we are so thrilled that Samantha and Justin are here. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Hi, so happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. So tell me, Smith and Justin, how did you find out about the EBB childbirth class and what kind of inspired you to take the class? Yeah. So, I mean, this was my second pregnancy and birth and this was Justin's first baby. So I kind of didn't think I needed to take a childbirth class, but I wanted Justin to have the opportunity to know what was going on. And I know I might talk about it a little bit later, but my first pregnancy, my support person wasn't very supportive. So I really was hoping to have a lot more support for this birth. And as a scientist, I really was looking for something that would give us the tools to kind of decide what made the most sense for us and was also science backed and, you know, not a bunch of just woo sort of stuff. So Justin actually is the one who found the EBB course. Oh, how did you find it? Google searches, kind of looking okay. around and uh, and seeing what was available. And then the basis around evidence-based birth with the science-based approach and looking at the scientific research really kind of spoke to me as well. I'm definitely a, a data nerd and a science nerd. And that was really kind of where I wanted to, to look at as well. Awesome. So you were ready to geek out with us on the evidence-based research. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think for me, it was looking at what do I need to do to make sure that I get her and the baby to the hospital safely and not even really thinking about what happens after that and me needing to actually do things and be prepared for things. So So you were thinking about that like infamous drive to the hospital and kind of getting to that point. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you know, only really being prepared for this whole situation by TV and movies, you know, you expect that like you know panicked oh my god my water broke let's rush to the hospital really not knowing what to do but then also kind of assuming that you know we live in a pretty good area in the united states you know you get to a hospital you're good to go not really having an understanding of all the things i didn't know uh going into it so yeah the assumption was that i was taking this to make sure that I was able to get her and the baby to the hospital safely and know what to look for and what to do before then. Learned a lot about what I didn't know from taking the class. <laughs> yeah. And then even for me, like I, I didn't think I needed a course because I had already given birth before. So I kind of just thought I knew everything. With my son, I didn't really take any birthing education courses. You know, I did the like, the two hour hospital tour that they offer. And at the time I was actually working as a nurse and I had freshly graduated from nursing school. So I kind of thought I knew everything already. (laughs) Yeah. You don't know what you don't know the first time. So what was your experience like taking the class together with Lori? I was really surprised because not only had 
things changed dramatically in the last 10 years. But I just, I, like you said, I didn't know what I didn't know. There was a lot of stuff that I had pre, you know, I, I had opinions about, but I didn't know the evidence behind stuff. And there's just a lot of information, you know, I, I, I honestly didn't know anything about the like the different phases of labor and, you know, some of the things to get labor started that, you know, I had heard all of the like the tips and tricks, but I never really thought about the evidence behind it or like how well any of those things worked. And yeah, you know, my primary source was just looking up information or through mom's groups. And I never had really done the research behind a lot of this stuff. There was a lot of initially, I think a lot of great information. And, you know, as, as we're getting up toward actually having the baby, getting up to the, those later stages and signs and things to look for, and I'm studying, you know, all of this information and all that. But then we kind of crossed that threshold where I didn't really expect there to be a whole lot of information. And it was just eye opening, right? You're looking at a whole new world and not really understanding. I, I would say the, the first third of the class was kind of what I was expecting and really looking for. And the other two thirds of the class were very different from anything that I would have expected and changed a lot about our birth plan, about where we were ended up going to the hospital, learned a lot about doulas and uh, midwives. And, you know, these are words that I had heard before, but again, in that kind of, you know, Western American thinking for, uh, for at least me, I, again, I was focused on just get to the hospital and everything's good to go. And it really changed once uh, once we started getting a lot of the information presented, and it really started to become much more of um, looking at things in a more critical way, and and really looking to make sure that Samantha was able to get the experience that she wanted. Because so I didn't know that there were totally different experiences that you could have even between two hospitals that are right next to each other. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Like, what kind of birth were you planning? before you took the class and like, how did your plans change? Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest thing for me is, you know, I, I really wanted to have an empowering birth experience, you know, with my son, you know, I had a healthy baby boy, like the end result was wonderful. At the time I had wanted to have an unmedicated birth, but having not really had any tools, I didn't really have the support to go through the stages of labor in a way that I wanted to. I was in labor for almost 48 hours with him and ended up going into the hospital sooner than I maybe would have otherwise. And, you know, I don't know, you get to the hospital and they connect you to the monitors and they don't let you relax. So next thing you know, like I haven't had a chance to like catch my breath and I'm just miserable. So I ended up getting the epidural, which wasn't what I wanted. And that was kind of the big thing. So we kind of went into this. I, at the time, I just wanted to have an unmedicated birth. I wanted to have, and like, is it just an empowering experience? Like I wanted to actually go through the labor and feel the labor contractions and all of those things because you hear about stories about people who go unmedicated and it sounds so you know incredible like just the experience overall and I felt like I really kind of missed out on that and it wasn't really until we took the course so at the time we were planning on delivering here in Roseville and then when we took the course we learned about having a doula and we learned about going online and checking the statistics of the different hospitals. And because of that, we ended up deciding to hire Lori, who was our instructor. We hired her as our doula and through her guidance and her expertise and familiarity with the different hospitals, we made the decision to change hospitals because the hospital Sutter Davis had the birthing tubs available <clears throat> and they had the midwife experience, which was what I was looking for. And also based, it was as close to a golden ticket birth as we could possibly get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for our listeners who aren't familiar, we talk in the EBB Talbert class about how do you get the golden ticket? It's like the Willy Wonka chocolate factory and getting the golden ticket, the, the grand prize <laughs> <laughs> or the, the fast track to the easiest birth possible. And you, we're giving birth at a place that was supportive of, of your wishes. How was that making that switch? Like, did you have to switch providers to like the clinics you were at? It was 
awful. It was a really terrible experience. And the, a lot of that centered around how insurance handles pregnancy and birth because I was 20 weeks. I was about halfway through the, the pregnancy, maybe 30 weeks. It was, it was, a it was closer on. to 30. Cause I think after 26, it became a whole thing. And they basically said, no, you can't do that. Yeah. So <laughs> that my original OB, cause I was hesitant because changing hospitals also meant a 40 minute drive versus a 10 minute drive. And there was just a lot of concerns. So we waited probably longer than we should have, but the process of changing you know, my insurance told me that I needed to get a referral from my OB to be seen by the midwife team. The OB that I saw refused to give me a referral and then actually kicked me out of her practice. I got a Dear John letter in the mail that I was no longer... No longer eligible for services there. Yeah. <laughs> it still makes me a little emotional, just yeah. like being... Being told you don't have a doctor when you're 30 weeks pregnant. Yeah. And so it was just a lot of phone calls with the insurance company and you already have all these hormones because you're pregnant and you're stressed out and you just want to be able to safely have your baby. And that wasn't a priority. Like you would think that the insurance company would be super supportive of you switching to lower intervention care. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, there was a lot of hoops that we had to jump through. And yeah, the worst part was just that the, my previous doctor just not supporting mm -hmm. my wishes to move on to another practice. Treating you like some kind of criminal for yeah. switching providers. Yeah. yeah. Cause I remember like, I would ask them questions like, Oh, well, what happens when I go to the hospital? And like, why are you doing this procedure? And like, they never really could give me answers. It was like, oh, whoever was doing the procedure was like, well, you need to talk to someone else about that. So you just kind of got passed around a lot. And, you know, just the more we learned in our childbirth class, like the more I became uncomfortable with my traditional OB care. Mm -hmm. They were very much looking for the autopilot. You just show up and we'll do what we need to do. And then you'll go home with the baby. Mm -hmm. And they were very much not interested in, answering any kind of questions or giving any kind of like substantive response. And then it almost seemed like it was taken personally when she decided to switch yeah. care providers. Mm -hmm. I will say that I maybe with different insurance and maybe with going through the switching process earlier, we may have avoided some of that. I, I can't say for certain, but there were definitely yeah. some artificial barriers that were thrown up. And there was definitely, in the end, it all worked out. We were able to do everything that we needed to do. And, and you know, I, I'd kind of jump in and just feel like, you know what, no matter what, like, we're going to the hospital we want to go to, and we'll figure everything else out later. Like, we're going to do what we want to do. But the insurance company was basically telling her that if you don't jump through our hoops, then your entire uh, thing will not be covered. You know, it'll be completely out of pocket, which would not have been great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So first, it's like your request to transfer care is refused by the first provider and then they fire you leaving with you without care. Yeah. And then the insurance company is holding this over your head. You're going to be right. on the hook for the entire labor and delivery, which we all know is very expensive, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, so that puts you in a really bad situation and that's just really unethical of that OB to put someone in that right. situation like that. Yeah. yeah it was unfortunate, mm -hmm. but you know, I had the consultation at the with the midwife team and it was just a breath of fresh air because you go in i wasn't in the waiting room for like 45 minutes waiting for my appointment like they actually saw me on time and then the the midwife answered all my questions like i didn't even have to really ask as many questions because she just explained everything to me everything i wanted to know she was happy to give me information about they gave me you know lots of different pamphlets and i just felt comfortable Right. Which was the big change. Yeah. Well, I think you also had mentioned as well that you felt like they treated you more like an individual, like right. a person. They had information pulled up about her and oh, right. me. Yep. They wanted to know about what she wanted to do as part of the birth plan. They actually asked questions about that rather than just 
putting us on autopilot of you're going to go through what we what we tell you to. And then one of the things that really struck me about a difference in the in the kind of care that we were getting there, that Samantha was getting there, was one of the times where they were going to do some kind of an exam and they specifically asked for her permission before touching her at all, which I had never seen a doctor behave that way and when it was I thought that that was that that was really cool but yeah it was definitely a very different experience right from the beginning yeah. going into that care team at the end of your pregnancy what was your mindset like you'd made this shift you were established with the midwife clinic and you had Lori on your team yeah and Lori was just crucial for all of this she was mm-hmm. such a great support through everything because you know through all of the troubles with switching the hospital she was right there with us and you know, no matter what, like you, you know, I'll still, you know, she was still able to be our, and she would help us through the process. So like, at least we had her so that if the switch over hadn't worked out the way we wanted to, we were still very reassured that we would have Lori available to advocate for us. But I felt, you know, having gone over to this team, having a doula, having a lot of the information and really kind of just knowing what we wanted and understanding the limitations of our expectations. I was pretty calm going into it. I mean, the biggest concern I had was just the drive because it was still, you know, a 40 minute drive without traffic down the highway. And then, so just kind of trying to know what the timing was, you know, and I assumed that I would have a very long labor because my labor with my son was very long. But then everyone tells you like, oh, but you're second, it's going to be really fast. So there's just, I think that was my biggest concern Mm -hmm. was just the drive. But other than that, it was, you know, we had a care team at the hospital that we knew were going to take care of us. And we had Lori Mm -hmm. to help us out. And then Justin, of course, is very supportive. So I, I just felt really supported. Yeah, and I'll definitely, I mean, second what, what Samantha was saying about the about having uh, our doula there, Lori, was fantastic. I mean, even little things, you know, pulling up to the hospital, and this is my first time doing, and as calm as I generally am about things, underneath the surface, I am, you know, a ball of nerves, and here we are pulling up to the hospital entrance, and Lori is standing right there ready to go. And she is literally holding Samantha up during a contraction while I'm finding the first parking space I can get the car into and running over to them. And yeah, she was just phenomenal to have. I'll definitely say that as a first time father going through that experience, it is it is wonderful to have the information available to you and the training available to you. It is a whole other level when you've got that extra support person there giving you that reassurance, giving you that extra help. I tried my best to learn all of the correct positions to uh, help with pain relief and everything, but uh, Lori teaches this stuff. She you know, has lived this for many births within her own family and with, within her, with her customers. And so she was able to do just phenomenal work to assist us throughout that whole process. I really appreciate your words of affirmation about doulas. It kind of makes me tear up because we were just talking on our team about how doulas have been through so much through the pandemic and a lot of them are traumatized and, you know, have had a lot of terrible experiences. And so we were just actually thinking, what are some words of affirmation we can send to doulas this week? And Justin, your words just really resonate with me. So I hope any doulas who are listening can take that as a personal compliment, even if you're not Lori and gratitude for what you do. So how did your labor begin though? You you mentioned pulling into the hospital and Lori greeting you. How did how did you know it was time to go? Did you labor at home? Like what happened? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, and this is another area where Lori was crucial because, you know, I I woke up, it was a Friday morning and contractions had started. They were pretty mild, like 10 minutes apart, like nothing too crazy. So, you know, I I tried to go back to sleep and then I ended up getting up and you know, I had to get my son ready for school. So my my primary concern in that moment was like, I I can't go into labor until I at least get my older child to school. (laughs) (laughs) And um, so, you know, got him breakfast and kind of, you know, did some chores to just kind of keep myself busy. And then when it was time to take him to school, I had to get Justin because while the contractions weren't super strong yet, I didn't feel safe to drive. 
So I did have Justin drive us in and definitely sitting in the car was probably the worst position because I was so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The contractions got stronger while we were driving. Um, but we, we dropped him off and then I was able to call my parents. So they're luckily local and they were on the hook now to pick him up from school. We went back to the house and once I got home, and I was able to relax again, the contractions kind of eased off a little bit. You know, we're in communication with our doula Lori, sending her texts, and she's kind of guiding us through the process and giving me suggestions on what position to try and different things that we had discussed in the childbirth class too. So I, you know, the sideline position and then getting on my birthing ball, shaking the apple tree. What else did we do? We went for a walk. Justin was on the ball. Like I think probably the best part of the childbirth class was uh, teaching the future dads to take care of mom. So he was bringing me water and snacks and all things that I probably wouldn't have done on my own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh but so, yeah, so, you know, the contractions kind of started getting closer together, but in my head, it's like, no, it's not time yet. It's not time yet. Cause I knew I didn't want to go to the hospital too early. And then because of my last experience, I going there early, I associated with having more interventions, but then what was that around like one thirty? I, mean, I made some notes here Let's see, around one thirty, I I had sat up from the couch and I felt a little pop and then a gush went into the bathroom and it was clear that my water had broken. I didn't really know what to expect because I my water did not break with my first until after I had the epidural. So I was a little surprised there was some blood, which had me pretty worried. Uh, but I was able to talk to our doula who reassured me that it was most likely okay. But if I was worried, she recommended that we go ahead and drive into the hospital. And so, so we did at that time. So I was like two or so a little bit after two mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, the drive was not fun at all is definitely, you know, the roads aren't too bumpy or anything, but definitely just uncomfortable. You're sitting, you've got a seatbelt on. And then we're calling the hospital for the intake process because they have you call before you come in. They put me on hold for eight minutes. <laughs> and then they're minutes. trying to ask me questions and I'm having contractions. And I just remember they're like, hello, are, are you still there? And I'm like, no, she's still here. Like She's just having a contraction right now. But it was, it was not... It was not a fun car ride. No. <laughs> but I, I would still maintain absolutely worth it to get where we ended up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so what happened when you got there? Yeah, so like Dustin had mentioned, uh, we pulled up. Lori was already there waiting for us. So he was able to drop me off curbside. And I, as soon as I got out of the car, I had a really strong contraction. And I'm just so happy that Lori was there because I was able to just kind of fall into her and she could support me while I was having that contraction and help me walk into the hospital. You know, you, you check in, they give you your new masks. You know, they don't want you to wear the masks you had in, on ahead of time. They tried to give me a wheelchair, but I refused. I didn't want to go in a wheelchair, but what I hear from everyone else is that I needed one. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you were refusing the wheelchair, another contraction struck and you <laughs> collapsed into the wall as they're just bringing the wheelchair for you anyway. <laughs> um, and then in going into the hospital, we weren't sure if we were going to get a tub because the hospital only had two tubs. Two or three, something or three, like so that. So it depended on how many people, if someone was already there, you know, they set that expectation that you might not get the tub, but they checked us into the room and I was so relieved to see that we did have the tub. Then they set us up, you know, part of the policy is they do require that you do the 20 minutes of monitoring. So they did put me on a, what did it, but the, the mobile one, right? What did it, the, the monitor. And I can't imagine being on continuous monitoring in that experience because I was so uncomfortable. My contractions were so strong already at the time. 
So like I couldn't just sit back and lay there for the monitor. So I had to get up and then the monitors like readjusting. So they were having a hard time getting a reading, but they did luckily just go ahead and they took it off after the 20 minutes. They said everything was fine. They, in order to do the tub birth, you had to get your COVID test and be COVID negative before you could get in the tub. So we were waiting for them to do the COVID test, but our, our nurse, Marie, bless her, she went ahead and got the tub filled up for us, anticipating that we would be negative. And while we waited for that, you know, they they did do a um, the, the speculum test and there was there was a bit of bleeding, but they said there wasn't anything to worry about. Of course, I was still worried. But yeah, so then they, they took the monitor off. There was we did have a student nurse a student midwife mm-hmm. present along with the regular midwife mm-hmm. they did ask if that was okay and the, yeah and we said it was fine because you know i had been a student nurse before so i understood like you know you got to learn somewhere but once i was able to get into that tub it was just it was a huge relief because just all of that pressure from the baby was just relieved and you just get in the tub I just remember just like just it just felt amazing but of course I'm still uncomfortable because I'm still in labor so I definitely was changing positions a lot I think I got out of the tub a few times I remember being out of the tub at one point and I remember my contractions were so strong and I started having the urge to bear down but we'd only been there like 30 minutes. So it's like, there's no way that it's time. You know, I, I wanted, I went ahead and I requested that they do a cervical check because I'm, I'm like in my head, there's no way, but it's like, I feel like I'm ready to give birth. And, um, the student midwife did the check and she told me that I was three centimeters. I just remember being so disappointed and heartbroken because at the time you're, you know, I'm feeling these urges and I I'm ready to bear down. I'm like holding on to Justin. I'm squatting. I can like barely stand through these contractions. And in my head, it's like, well, if I'm only at three centimeters, what's this going to feel like when I'm at nine or 10? Like, I don't know if I can do this. There were so many doubts that went through my head at that time. But, you know, I ended up getting back in the tub and then close to five. So this was now an hour later. Mm-hmm. I, I I was done. I, I haven't, they're telling me, you know, Justin and Lori are reminding me to use low breath tones. And I remember in my head, it's like, I can't do a low breath tone sounds because if I do, I'm going to push and I've been told not to push. So, you know, I expressed this. And so Lori recommended that if, if I wanted it to go ahead and ask for another cervical check. And this time the nurse Marie did the check and I was nine centimeters, a hundred percent effaced. So she told me to go ahead and start pushing And the midwife popped in to kind of check on how things were going. At the time, you know, I had just started pushing and Marie told the midwife like, oh, you know, she just started pushing. We're doing okay. And at the time there was another mother who was starting to push. She was crowning. She was crowning. So the midwife double checked that she would be okay to go help assist the other mother And if we thought we needed to have the on-call OB come in to assist us and we, well, the nurse Marie told her, no, we've got time. Go ahead and go help the other mother. Well, nine minutes later, Kira was born. (laughs) Nine minutes of pushing in the tub. And then all of a sudden just a head pops out and I'm just looking at this head underwater and as a new dad, I'm like, oh, well, that's there now. And all of a sudden, the nurses, the nurse is also shocked. She's not expecting this to just be there. And so now all of a sudden, she is like pulling, like pulling, pulling. And I'm not expecting this much going on. So I'm just kind of standing there in shock watching this happening. Yeah. Well, and I will say, too, one thing that no one really tells you about with the tub birth is so my instinct is, you know, her, her head emerges 
And my instinct is that, okay, she's underwater. I need to get out of the tub now. So Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get out of the tub. I don't really know what's going on. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the nurse had to kind of calm me down, get me to relax so that then she could finish helping Kira come out of the birth canal all Mm -hmm. the way and keep me under the water because I was just ready to hop out. And I guess, I don't know if it was mentioned anywhere, but no one had really mentioned what happens you know, what happens after you crown Mm -hmm. and the baby comes out, you know. So the baby doesn't breathe until their face hits the air. So I think the mistake that some parents make, like you were mentioning, is they kind of, if they don't know what's going on, they'll stand up. Yeah. And then the baby, you know, then sit back down. And so you're trying to avoid that situation. Yeah. And and it makes sense. But at the time, you know, you're just in the moment. You're like, my baby's head is out. I need to stand up. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> it was just a really weird sensation. But yeah, but then she came out and, you know, they were able to put her on my chest and I was able to do the skin to skin contact. And I could see that was when all the emotions started yeah. like pouring out right then and there. And it was it was beautiful. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And through all of this, it was great, too, because as we are laboring, you know, I have Justin to support me. And then we had our doula who was able to, you know, use her expertise. So her like hip squeezing was phenomenal. But the most important thing is she was able to like pop out into the hallway and like get the nurse's attention when we needed stuff and kind of guide us through what needed to be done and just being an extra person so that Justin didn't have to leave me. You know, Mm -hmm. like when I started feeling like I needed to push, like she could just go grab the nurse, tell them what was going on. Mm -hmm. And that was really nice. Right. Yeah, definitely allowed me to kind of focus all my attention on Samantha and what was going on with her and not have to worry about anything else that was going on around us. And yeah, Lori was phenomenal through the entire thing. She was everywhere that we needed her to be and doing things that we didn't even know needed to be done. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, but the tub was just, oh, it was an amazing experience because, yeah, it just made such a difference, I think, Mm because even though, you know, through the, you're still feeling the contractions, but there was a huge difference between a contraction standing up or kneeling or in any position out of the water compared to in the water. But yeah, but then, you know, our beautiful baby girl was born and then, you know, they help you get out of the tub so that then they can deliver the placenta out of the tub mm-hmm. and that was wild mm-hmm. <laughs> but what uh, what feelings um and thoughts were going through both your heads right after kira came out i mean it was just such a relief and you just see this like beautiful little baby and she's just perfect just that euphoria that they talk about like when she comes out and then they put her on your chest and just you know, just being able to hold her and like it, like disbelief almost that like, here she is like all of this that we went through today. And like, here's this beautiful baby in my arms. And, you know, she's just the sweetest little thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I guess for me, I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking around at people that do this all the time, you know, between our doula, between the nurse, and and I'm kind of looking to them, is everything okay? Because I'm still the anxious first time dad. And and there was a little bit of anxiety at first. What I kind of put together later on was because she wasn't crying when she came out. And it wasn't that she wasn't breathing and it wasn't that she wasn't okay. This kid just almost never cries. And so I think they kind of figured that out pretty quickly. And then once everybody else relaxed, then I relaxed. Yeah. And at that point, it was just kind of getting to enjoy that moment of seeing Samantha and our new baby together. And yeah, that was just, that was tremendous. And I think that's important for parents listening who want a water birth to know that too, that most babies don't cry after a water birth. They're usually very calm and quiet. And you're, you're right. Probably your baby also as well, maybe was showing their temperament a little bit early, but most babies because of the warmth and Mm. kind of the calm nature of the birth, Mm-hmm. It's such a gentle entry into the world that they don't have that kind of shock of coming out into bright lights and cold yeah. air. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And it was nice too, because, you know, she was born and then I got to hold her right away. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have to 
give her up. You know, they waited until after we had the skin to skin contact before they did any other interventions before they weighed her and did all these other things. So you didn't have that with your first? No, no. With my first, you know, he was born and I mean, it's hard to, cause I mean, it was 10 years ago, so I don't necessarily remember all of the events, but he definitely, you know, they, they weighed him and they measured him. They gave him his shots and the eye ointment. And then I got to have the skin to skin contact with him. Mm -hmm. Um, But it definitely, there was like a period and you you don't get them right away. But with this, it was just so nice. And, you know, just have her just right away. We got that contact and yeah, you know, you talk about like, the room is like warm and the lights are dim. So it's just, it's relaxing and it's not clinical. And just the focus was just on her well being. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once they moved me back up to the hospital bed and then they're working on delivering the placenta, then, you know, then the glides come on and then they're kind of doing their interventions, but they definitely gave us our time first. Mm -hmm. And then they left the room and then came back after however long it was that they came back in. Yeah. To do the, just the weighing and measuring and the normal things that they do. But yeah, no, it it was great to just see them once they got the placenta delivered and and they were confident that there wasn't an issue with bleeding. We had opted out of the, uh, the shot to, uh, to, to control bleeding unless it was necessary. For me, yeah. Right. And, uh, and they essentially did that evaluation as they were kind of doing things. I know in your case, there was uh, just the, area where the placenta had attached, there was some increased risks involved there with some bleeding and things. Um, and that's why they wanted to kind of keep an eye on that, make sure everything was okay. But aside from that, I mean, they really did probably the absolute bare minimum outside of what is absolutely necessary to deliver a healthy, happy baby. And mm-hmm. I think that's exactly what you had been looking for, yeah. you know, from this whole thing. And I will say that you have pictures and it was shocking. So one thing that I don't know that maybe people wouldn't know about a top birth and I don't know if this is normal. So maybe you could say if it was or not, but just with the top birth, the amount of blood Mm -hmm. is shocking. And I think I'm assuming it's mostly just because it's in the water, but I know Justin had taken a picture and I didn't, I wasn't aware of this, but looking at some of the pictures afterwards, it's, it's almost kind of frightening to look at. So if you're not knowing what to expect with that, but. And I think every birth is different. And one of the things when nurses and midwives specifically train in water birth is they actually will do exercises um, Well, they'll dump a certain amount of like dye in the water Um, and use it to train them to learn like how much blood is too much blood. Right. Okay. That, yeah, makes, that makes sense. sense. Yeah. I know with my water birth, I didn't have, there was no blood in the water. Oh, the water was like perfectly clear when I got out and delivered the placenta, but maybe because of, you know, the bleeding you'd mentioned earlier when your water broke, there was something different. Yeah, well, I think and plus- sometimes, yeah. When you see birth photographers, when they post pictures of water births, you see a kind of a variety, but I think the important thing is having like, a care team that's experienced and can right. look at the water and kind of estimate. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, because yeah. I think the placenta had started to separate, and so mm-hmm. that was a lot of the problem. You got like the gush. There's like from, a little yeah. gush, gush of blood when that separates. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, when the baby came out, I mean, the water was completely clear. Everything was good. It was when by the time Samantha was getting out of the tub, which wasn't that much past that point. I mean, it was. It looked like Merlot. It was. It was very, very deep red. And I assumed because nobody else was panicking that we were okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's the important thing is having. And that's probably why home. they were keeping an eye on you afterwards, right. then mm-hmm. probably because yeah. of that. Yeah. But having a care team that we trusted to be like, okay, if they are saying that this is okay and our doula says that things are okay and we know we have a care team that's looking out for our best interest, it made it a lot more mm. reassuring. Right. And I think having that doula too, you, you build that trust, that trust relationship over time. Everybody at the hospital was absolutely wonderful. I have zero complaints about anyone that was there. They were all great, but we just met them that day. 
our doula, we had known as, you know, particularly through the birth class, but even outside of that, she was, she came over and met us at our home. She kept in contact with, we built that trust over time. And I trusted her in that moment to let us know if, or at least let me know if there was something to be concerned about. And so I was able to look to her for that reassurance. Okay. Lori's not panicked. I don't need to panic. Everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, because she's been through this many, many times before, and I have no idea. I have had the, the, the knowledge put into my head, but it's amazing how fast knowledge goes out the window when you're in the that moment and full of the emotion and some of the anxiety and everything else kicks in. It's just so helpful to have that extra reassurance right there that you know things are okay. How did your postpartum go the, the weeks following the birth? Yeah, I mean, the postpartum went pretty well. You know, I think we got really lucky. Kira's temperament, she's definitely a pretty easygoing baby. With her, you know, I was able to breastfeed. That's what I wanted to do with her. And she took to that pretty quickly, which was nice. Mm -hmm. I know with my first, I struggled with that. We had a really hard time, you know, with my son, my milk hadn't come in for several days until after we brought him home from the hospital. And I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing with her, you know, even though I had breastfed before, it still felt brand new because it was long enough ago, but sh she took to it pretty easily. And then, you know, it seemed that my milk had come in pretty quickly with that one. And I don't know if a lot of that has to do with maybe the, the natural delivery and some of the hormones that get released from that. But we definitely had a lot easier experience with her. And then she's, she's a good sleeper. So I think that made a huge difference that she, you know, slept on our chest, but she definitely slept pretty well. And she wasn't, you know, she's, she's never been a big crier. So we got really lucky with her in that regard. I do know that even though the breastfeeding felt like it was coming natural. <clears throat> and I don't know how, I don't remember at what appointment that was, but when we went to our pediatrician for the follow-up, there were a lot of concerns about her weight gain. She, she was born at seven pounds, five ounces. And, you know, the following appointments, she was in the very bottom percentiles and her doctor was concerned about her weight gain. And that was a really big struggle because wanting to exclusively breastfeed was something that I wanted to do with her. But then here, you know, we are potentially finding out that maybe I'm not producing enough or she's not eating enough. But that problem seemed to correct itself. And this is something that I, I was thinking about last night that I remember in the early weeks, you know, there's all these questions and all these things that you don't know about a newborn. And there really isn't an evidence-based newborn class. <laughs> and I remember Justin was wanting one. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been nice because there is a lot of conflicting, just like with pregnancy, there's so much conflicting information out there about what you know, makes the most sense to do for caring for a newborn. So you're kind of just winging it based off of what feels right and what the doctors tell you to do. And so it's always just kind of confusing, but, you know, we got through it. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of pressure that you put on yourselves and that are put on you or for the people around you. You feel some of that from the pediatrician to make sure that you're doing all the right things and, and, it can be very difficult to know what those are. At the end of the day, I mean, people have been having babies for millions of years, but you still want to do the best that you can do. And yeah, it, it's it's becomes a very much a, an information thing, I think, for being able to, to wade through fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the internet has much, much fiction. And even before the internet, there was plenty of, you know, information that got exchanged between people that some of it had some basis and a lot of it didn't. So there's definitely some struggles there. 
I would say that. And yeah, we definitely lost a lot of like passed down generational wisdom mm-hmm. too during the mm-hmm. 1900s, you know, when breastfeeding was discouraged. And then we like go into these more isolated home environments where right. many people aren't exposed to babies until they have one themselves. Mm-hmm. And so and it's a, there's like a double thing where, you know, it's hard to find evidence-based information, but we've also lost that kind of wisdom of just being around babies and caring for them our whole mm-hmm. lives, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, and then especially, you know, Kara was born last year. We're still in the middle of the pandemic. So they, you just don't have the same level of community support having a mm-hmm. baby in a pandemic as you do under normal circumstances, you know, and not, not to like compare everything to my first son, but with my first son, we, there were the, the mommy and baby classes that were led by a lactation consultant. So I was able to go to that and form a community with other mothers. And that community has been invaluable. Like we still hang out with each other. I actually, you know, our kids are all turning 10 this year. And I just, we had a little camp out this last weekend where all the boys got together and we're all playing and hanging out. And as moms, we stay in touch and we go do brunches and we do all this stuff. So that was an integral part of me building mom community. But with Kira, you know, here I have this newborn and I have family support and I had Lori as our doula for support, but I just never really was able to form that community because you didn't have the in-person meetings. They did have some, you could do the virtual meetings, but like, that's just, it's just not the same to meet other people over Zoom and it's hard to like get up on a, you know, pull a computer up when you just, you don't really want to be on a camera. And so I'd say that was the thing that's probably missing the most is just that, that lack of mom community as a result of just not being able to get together with other people at the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm building it back up now as things are starting to open up in our local area and Mm -hmm. able to get out and do stuff, but it was, it, it definitely made it more challenging I did also want to mention too, just talking about postpartum in general, one of the things that I think struck me in Samantha's case was how physically able she was once we got home. We stayed the absolute minimum in the hospital. We just wanted to get back home. Everybody was healthy and happy and safe. So we stayed the minimum 24 hours that we needed to be there pretty much to the minute and then came home. And and Samantha was up and around. We have stairs. She was able, thankfully, to make it up into bed and back and you know back and forth as she needed to, pretty much right away, which was great. And I think a lot of that was came back down to the low intervention, the the lack of uh, episiotomy, obviously adding unnecessary trauma to the body, and the the lack of you know drugs and other things that would have potentially slowed some of the healing and recovery. I really feel like. That, that had to be the minimum level of trauma to the body from uh, a pretty big experience. But yeah, I thought that was really impressive, particularly considering that she had gone through that whole experience with, with no painkillers, with really just the physical support from myself and the doula, and then the, the water birth. Those things together, along with the supportive environment with the hospital, I really feel like that contributed tremendously to a really fast recovery. And I think that's also goes along with like, what I was looking for in a, in a birth was that empowering experience that here I was able to have this baby in this tub all these emotions and feelings that you get along with it. And then I was able to get out of the tub and walk around Mm -hmm. and just how incredible it is that I have a body that's capable of doing all of this. It sounds like you ended up getting what you wanted, the empowering birth experience. Yeah, no, it absolutely was. It was, it was an incredible experience. So Justin and Samantha, so thank you so much for sharing your story. Do you have any final advice for people listening who are planning on entering birth or parenthood soon? Yeah. 
I mean, I don't know if you can tell kind of from all of the stuff we've said, but if you're able to have a doula, I 100% recommend having a doula, even if it's just like for virtual support. You know, if you can't have a doula in the hospital room with you, even just having someone available to talk to about your concerns and your worries and be able to kind of phone in and give you advice and walk you through the different processes, the having a doula was probably the most valuable part of our whole experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, absolutely, if at all possible, have a doula and also do the research. It is, uh, it is shocking what a huge difference it can be, the experience between two hospitals sitting right next to each other in an otherwise great area. You cannot expect that you're going to have the same level of care and the same experience in two different places. It is absolutely worthwhile to go through and understand what it is you're getting into before you go there, because you don't want to find out when you show up that this is not what I want. Mm -hmm. This is not the experience to, to have ruined by stuff like that. So even though you had to go through all that trouble to switch, you feel like it was absolutely the right decision. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. I think it was definitely the right decision. Even and with the 40 minute scary drive, uh, it's totally <laughs> worth it. Once you get there, you're like, no, this is, this is exactly yeah. what we were hoping for all yeah. the way. Yeah. I mean the 40 minutes scary drive and also just the 40 minute drive for every single appointment when you're going for these checkups every, you know, month and then every couple of weeks. And then we went over our due date. So then you have, it, it was a lot of driving, but just being in that office, I could tell that that was where I needed to be because mm -hmm. it just felt right. And, you know, like Justin had mentioned, like I was, I was a person, you know, they not only would ask me about how I was feeling in that moment, but they also would ask about Justin. They would ask about my other child and they had no, like they would review my chart before coming in to talk to me. So they weren't just like reading a page and asking me stuff based off of what they're reading in the chart. Like they, they, they read information beforehand or they remembered from a previous appointment and were able to talk to me just like a normal human being. And I think that made a huge difference in how we felt going into the experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again, Samantha and Justin, for taking time out of your busy schedule as parents to <laughs> come on the podcast. We appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah. Thank you so much for yeah, having thank us. Thank you for having us.